co-host of the Society of American Military Engineers. The, and you're going to have to tell me the full name of the IEEE entity. Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, okay. uh, the New York section, and we represent uh, the, the, construct of the consultants network. Okay, but you're part of IEEE. IEEE. Okay. That's and of course, our uh, our infinitely wonderful host, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New York District, for making the room available. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation on uh, the Panama Canal Expansion Program. We'll hear more about the uh, program, and I'll let you do the introductions of our guest speaker. Mm -hmm. But I thought it might be nice if we just go around the room and, uh, and introduce uh, one another to uh, one another. So why don't we start here? Well, my name is Roy Lau. <coughs> I'm a senior member of IEEE. I've been an engineer. I work for Con Ed. The average American has seven career changes. I have tripled that amount. Uh, right now, my college professor are teaching in uh, three uh, four different colleges. I teach project management, emerging technology, and IT. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, I'm Richard Dable, Corps of Engineers um, in the Planning Division. And I deal mainly with uh, wetland restorations and uh, flood control projects. Hi, I'm Gail Woolley, also of the New York District Corps of Engineers. I'm with I'm Eddie Major. I'm a deputy area engineer at the West Point office in the New York District. I'm John Ruder. I work with the Corps of Engineers, <laughs> Planning Division, and Economics. Good morning, I'm, um, I'm paid from Salvatore, but call me Sam uh, in battle. I'm with the uh, New York District um, uh, Construction Division, and I'm a metro area engineer of New York uh, metropolitan area. And I have a special interest in this uh, uh, class. I've been involved as a team leader, resident engineer, and area engineer at the New York Harvard Evening Program since 1999. That's great. <laughs> My name is Chris Anastasia. I work in the Corps of Engineers. I'm a resident engineer at the Metro West Resident Office, which oversees the judging program. So I have similar interests to Sam. Good morning. My name is Larry Morillo. I'm Charlie Somerville. I work with Vicente. I work for Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation. We are involved in the financing of this expansion project, and I'm also prior to U.S. Navy Seal. Ken Bobetsky uh, with AECOM, program manager assigned to the Port Authority on the Gospels Bridge, replacing the fire. Speed bridge. And somewhat related to this. Uh, but not like the Bay <laughs> uh, I'm Marty Isaac. Uh, I uh, represent uh, Carlson uh, here in New York City, uh, Vice President. Uh, I also uh, uh, am uh, the chairperson for the Consultants Network of IEEE, and together with Mike, we uh, developed this uh, program for you. And uh, looking forward to uh, hearing about Panama Canal because that will be new to me as well. My name is Michael Chen, uh, and I'm the call of the New York District Engineering Division, Structural Leader, based in Take Care of Structural Division. Thanks. All right, why don't we now work this back row here, starting here. I'm Rick Simon with Urban Engineers. We're doing program management oversight for the FTA on the East Side Access and Second Avenue subway programs. I'm Molly O'Connor with Black and & Beach, and I'm a geotech engineer. Alex Bullers with Black and Beach. I'm in our water unit. 
I'm Professor McAllister. I'm department head, communications and mathematics at one of the local colleges. My background is electrical engineering, two degrees in computer science from the City College of New York. Okay, that's my alma mater, yeah. City there we go. College. I'm Robert Brightley. <laughs> we'll hear more about him in a few minutes. Yeah. I'm Zachary Margulies. I'm an intern at Towson Solutions, studying industrial engineering with a minor in electrical. At the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I spent 31 years with the Corps, half of it here at the district and half at the North Atlantic Division. I retired about two years ago. My last position here was Deputy Chief of Regulatory, but before that I've been uh, DPM <laughs> both in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've been up uh, as a branch chief in the construction division. I've worked in the engineering division. So I've been all over the place uh, here at the district. Uh, I just started a role literally this week with DiGeronimo Architects as a director of design and construction involved with the Build It Back program in uh, Brooklyn. And actually, we may be uh, having some stuff to do with uh, our AE conference who have, uh, who have Queens. Uh, before that, I spent a year with CBRE. They're a real estate facility manager uh, company, managing a, uh, a building in Midtown Manhattan, uh, occupied primarily by the Macquarie Bank of Australia. So uh, I'm, I'm retired, but my wife won't let me go fishing just yet. So I have to, I have to keep uh, keep working. A couple of administrative notes uh, before uh, I turn it over to Marty Isaac to tell you a little bit more about our guest speaker. If you'd like a cup of coffee or a little snack, there is a cafeteria on the sixth floor. They have a wide variety of snacks and little sandwiches and whatnot. And I think it's okay, as long as you're really careful and neat, it's okay to have a cup of coffee in this uh, particular room. We have seats around this side wall. Please feel free to, you know, bring your chair up, make yourself comfortable uh, so that you can see the presentation. Uh, if anyone needs to use the restroom, uh, I happen to still have my men's room key. Uh, it, was a, it was a retirement gift and it still works, so I can help the men. Uh, however, if you're a female and you don't work in the building, uh, you'll have to raise your hand and you know, I'll get one of the ladies that works here to escort you to the, uh, uh, to the ladies' room. So, uh, any questions before we get started? Uh, one more thing, if you're a New York State uh, PE, it's absolutely important, and even if you're a New Jersey PE, I don't know what the rules are about whether New Jersey will accept the PDH that we offer. The PDH that we offer will be issued by NYU uh, Polytechnic School of Engineering, uh, and it is valid, for, I know it's valid in the state of New York, it's probably good elsewhere, because New York is the most stringent of the states when it comes to uh, uh, to PE uh, PDHs. If you would like to receive a PDH, please ensure that you sign in. I absolutely must have your signature. That is your certification by law that you sat and uh, spent the entire time of the presentation uh, here. And so uh, it's very important. If you're not a PE but you'd still like to have get that little certificate, you're more than welcome to sign. Just make sure that you put a Y in the box that says, I would like a PDH. Uh, and I should have all of your email addresses. If for some reason it's not correct, you can make a, a correction there. All right. Uh, any other questions before we uh, get started? All right. Mike, do you want to perhaps allow about five minutes to exchange uh, business cards? Uh, sure. Well, we can either do that now or, if you want to wait five minutes or, uh, you know, well, the, pres the presentation will be about 45 minutes. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A and networking. But uh, if anyone would like now, would you like five minutes before we start or would you like to forge ahead and have some time after? Well, you tell me. Forge ahead. How many say forge ahead? Let's All go. right. The eyes have it. I don't have to count the names. So without further ado, I uh, present my good friend Marty Isaac to tell you a little bit more about our guest speaker. Thank you, Mike, and good afternoon uh, Thanks, to everyone. Uh, I'm uh, happy that you made it here. It was kind of difficult for us to get up here, <laughs> uh, first time in this building. Uh, but I see you all here, so I'm glad to see that. Uh, I uh, would like to uh, just tell you that uh, uh, IEEE, uh, I, there's uh, some members here, uh, 
is, is a, the largest engineering society in the world. Uh, it uh, uh, encompasses about uh, 460,000 members around the world, mostly in the States, uh, but Canada and, and, like I said, in the world. But enough about IEEE. Uh, it's, it's a joint meeting here with the same Society of American Military Engineer. And I want to thank Mike for really arranging all that. And we have another IEEE member that just came in. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce to you uh, uh, the speaker, which is my boss, uh, Robert Wright. Uh, he's a graduate engineer from uh, RPI uh, with a mechanical engineering background and has an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania. He uh, established uh, Towson Engineers in 2001 and he grew that business, uh, uh, just to let you know, in the last uh, three years, uh, it doubled uh, its uh, employees. Uh, Towson is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, <coughs> providing uh, construction management services and the niche uh, a specialty in, in uh, that endeavor is uh, contract audits, uh, as well as risk assessments for major projects. Uh, Carlson is involved uh, with uh, the oversight on uh, the East Side Access Project, uh, that has been going on since 1998. Uh, I've been uh, uh, involved with that project since the year 2000, uh, to, to some extent. Uh, also with uh, oversight on Second Avenue, who uh, is a sub to urban engineers, uh, and uh, uh, mainly you are here to hear about Panama Canal as as, as I am. Uh, so uh, yeah, Carlson was involved in uh, uh, the oversight uh, and monitoring of uh, activities on the Panama Canal uh, expansion program. So without further ado, I. Think I want to ask uh, Robert to come in and give the presentation. He's going to give you a presentation. Please hold your questions to the end. He's going to be able to answer uh, most of the questions. I don't know all of them. But uh, <laughs> uh, so so let's uh, let, let Robert uh, Panama now. Thank a little you. bit more about my background. I'm a Brooklyn Tech graduate. I don't know how many graduates here today. You <laughs> I know it's a fine one in New York here, <laughs> but um, just. You know, it's good to be talking about the Panama Canal. Uh, as Marty said, um, I'm founder president of Towson Solutions. And really, just a little small pitch about the firm is that, you know, the firm specializes in construction auditing, project management oversight, and general project consulting services um, in assisting projects. And uh, for the Panama Canal expansion program, I personally have been involved in the canal project since June 2008. So it's going on itself. I was just there in Panama last week. So it's a seven year anniversary. It's taken up a bit of my career for the project and it's been very, very rewarding project. Um, I, you know, the firm reports to the Inspector General's office of the Panama Canal. We're outside the engineering office, but specifically we report to the Inspector General's office reporting directly to the board of directors and we have green light to call the board any time, the chairman of the board, anything that we see. And our main responsibility is to um, identify risk associated with the successful execution of that project. Our job over the past seven years have been to look at the contract, the business controls, the financial controls within their contracts. We've done risk assessments for them. We've done quality audits for them around the world, I think in eight, in eight different countries. We've done training for their internal audit personnel. Uh, we have done, been there three shifts, 24 hours, just to analyze it, analyze their project. But our main focus is helping them execute, successfully execute the project, help them identify risk, ensure that their project management team both ACP, because their project management team is a combination of um, Panama Canal personnel and CHM2 Hill, which is an integrated team 
and our job is to make sure they do their job. So we spend considerable time analyzing the project in um, kind of in itself. Um, this today's slide presentation is very pictorial. We've got a couple of videos in there, but really to give you a sense of the project. I know there's numerous E and R magazines you read that has a lot of articles. You know, this is a mega project with all the issues of major mega projects. There's probably over two billion dollars of claims outstanding right now. It's a, it's a schedule. It's a it's a delay. It's supposed to start up in August 2014. First ship is probably not going to go through to publicly announced last week. Or, I mean April 2016. It's a logistical nightmare with worldwide procurement. You have a site that's over 50 miles on two different the Atlantic, Pacific. So. All the issues associated with mega projects has been challenging. Not speaking of the cultural challenges. I mean, we'll talk about who the contractors are on this project, bringing many different countries together, um, not used to working together on a mega project. Um, fortunately, all contracts except one is in English, um, so it helped us doing our job, but language is, is a barrier for workers, workers from all over the world working on this project. Um, so, I welcome questions. Um, some things I may not be able to answer just due to my position regarding the uh, Inspector General's office. My presentation has to be approved by them. I have to get permission. I cannot speak on behalf of the canal. I speak on behalf of Robert Bright, House of Solutions. Um, so, uh, we go from there. Uh, just the canal itself. And part of the presentation, some words you will see in Spanish. I'm still learning a little bit, need more lessons myself. But Panama Canal, it's, it's, it's not the largest project in the world, and I tell the board this all the time. New York City's East Side Access and Second Avenue Subway almost doubles the cost on some of this work. But this is the one everybody talks about because of the worldwide impact on it. And you guys are feeling it here in New York City as well. But this is, you know, they were like, Panama is the logistics center of the world for many um, uh, 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 of our uh, vessel transportation. So, um, the presentation, I'm going to go over a little bit about, you know, the history. We all know the canal opened up in 1914, started by the French in 1880. Um, here is actually, and you pass this around, this is a copy of one of the bonds that was issued by the French. Um, I was given a gift last year of the original, one of the original bonds in the office. And all that type of stuff. But it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting project. Uh, talk a little bit about the construction of the original canal, the approval process when it was approved, how it's being financed. Then we get into the really the works of the expansion, the dredging, access lanes, raising the Gatun Lake. And then a lot of time spent on the third set of locks, which is really, you know, the largest, you know, the large portion of the works there. Um, not spending a lot of time on the environmental impact, but there is a significant amount of environmental impact. Um, they had to relocate over 3,600 animals and different species related to this program, and there is a major environmental program that is impacted, as well as some indigenous people are impacted on this project as a result of raising the lake. So I won't spend a lot of time on that. If you have additional follow-up questions, I have plenty of material here. You can read about the program. I will say the Panama Canal website is very, very um, uh, resourceful. resourceful in terms of information on the project. All their reports have to be public. Um, so quite a bit of information on the canal itself. Uh, on the third set of locks projects, we're going to talk about the design and construction of the lock, and we briefly and, and some of the challenges. Talk a little bit about the excavation activity, fabrication of these huge gates, lock gates, as well as uh, the water saving basins, which is something. Um, I will mention that one of the one of the interesting challenges to hold this canal is the design life of this project is a hundred year design life. So. When you talk about this, why is it a 100 year design life? Anybody got any reason? The existing canal is 100 years old. Why can't you build a new canal that still operates? So, 
very challenging in terms of, 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 of moving forward in design. The general canal, a little bit background on the canal, um, you know, everything starts at the lake. This is the Gatun Lake. You have the Atlantic side, the Pacific side. Um, on, the, on the Atlantic side, you have three consecutive locks, which they call the Gatun Locks. On the Maris Flores side, you have two separate locks, Pedro Miguel Locks, and then you have two locks here before you enter the land. You know, so the vessel's 85 feet above, um, and the Gatun Lake pushes all the water in, all the water out from there. Uh, poles, up to $400,000, depending upon your ship, and they, each passage uses about 52 million gallons um, of water from there. This is just an area view of, of the canal, of the map. This is Pacific side here. I don't know how many, anybody been to Panama? So, all right, so some of this is for me, yeah. So this is the Pacific side here, the Bridge of Las Americas. Um, and then this is the Atlantic side, the Cologne. Uh, and in between is, is your Caruba Cut, the Gatun Lake, the locks, and so forth. But this is really the main shipping, main shipping route, about 80 kilometers. Uh, from there. Take the time to talk about the original construction of the canal. Started um, by what, De La Soups uh, in 1880. Uh, the French went bankrupt on it, uh, had, to, had to give it up. The United States took over in 1904. Um, but you can see some of the production, some of the um, means of construction, means of Canal at, at, at this point in, in, in time. Uh, 1904, as I mentioned, you know, the U.S. took it over, handed over the canal. This is some of the original construction. I can't tell you what lock this is, Atlantic or Pacific, but the project resumed in, you know, the project resumed, I, I, I mean, started up in, in uh, 1914. That was original. And really, the canal, when it was approved, it was supposed to be 100-year anniversary. First ship was supposed to go through in August 2014, but I'm sure everybody's heard about the delays and everything associated with this project. Um, this is the ship going through. Um, the one thing I will mention with the original canal uh, and 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 kind of where we are today uh, from a safety aspect. The original canal lost about 25,000 lives. Wow. Due to disease, right. construction attitude, this project lost six. Um, from the standpoint of supervisors, maintenance, as well as trade work. Still unacceptable at six, but you can see the difference of construction back in the early 1900s to where we are, we are, we are today. Um, this is Pedro Miguel locks, Atlantic side. This is a lock that's under maintenance. Um, let me tell you, it's a scary feeling when you're down here and knowing that the ocean's <laughs> on both sides. <laughs> you, you're down there walking around and so forth. But, uh, but you know, and this is down here are the ports for water to enter the lock today. Um, you will see with the new design, the ports are lateral on it, not on the not on the chamber floor. Uh, these are the gates of the canal. This is the top of, around here is probably where the lakeside is, coming from about 85. And this, you can see workers down here. This was doing a, 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 you know, a maintenance period. We had the opportunity to go down and look at the canal itself. And these are probably the original gates. That's just been maintained. And, um, just a little bit about the canal. I mean, this is, you can see all the different ports. And the thing about the canal, it's connected to ocean sides, Atlantic Pacific, by rail, by barge, and by truck. And you can see the level, of the you can see the capacity of, uh, of the, the TEUs across the different both sides of that. And this is planning to increase um, over time and, and, and expand from there. Uh, any general questions? All right. Uh, 
July 2006. <coughs> you know, once the Panama Canal is a country project. You know, and I remember my first trip down there in 2008, June, um, and I was talking to my client, the Inspector General. Our first conversation was, Robert, you work for the Inspector General, but you report to three million Panamanians because it is a country project, very proud country, proud, proud uh, citizens, um, and, it's, and it's the most important project within the country. But the project was approved um, in 2006, Law 28, um, and for the expansion of the canal. And it gave the approval to move forward to the Panama Canal Authority. The budget at the time was, was not to exceed $5.25 billion. Um, and that budget that's quite naturally being challenged, but that's still the law today. And now can spend no more, can spend less, but no more without getting Senate approval, country approval, to spend more than the required amount there. Why the expansion? I'm sure, um, you know, ships are getting larger, increased capacity required. This is the time frame in which they, which 2013, 14, in which they thought the Panama Canal is going to hit their capacity. And this is the PCUS, is the Panama Canal unit of measurement, their own unit of measurement to let its tonnage and capacity. And you can see going out to 2005, there may be, there's going to, 2025, there's still going to be some challenges. And I know people have been reading about a, a fourth canal, a canal in Nigeria by the Chinese and so forth. These are all conversations that are present today. But the really, you know, they need to increase the size in order to maintain the competitiveness of the Suez Canal as well as give people options in terms of where they want the ships to go. The canal or east to west from there. How's it backing? Uh, financial? It's, it's a combination. But really, the majority of the money is coming internally from the Panama Canal Authority. They're not taking out bonds or anything of that nature. This is internal operating funding that they have to fund the canal, and 2.3 million is coming from various different banks, anywhere from International Finance Corporation, the uh, European Investment Bank, PATH, and so forth. Um, and all these banks you can go <laughs> online, ACP, and they have to submit reports and so forth um, in terms of how this is being Financial. Let's talk about the main components of the Panama Canal program. Um, first is the access channel. This is the Pacific side of the uh, canal. This is the existing Maris Forest locks. This is the Pedro Miguel locks. Remember early in the conversation I said on the Pacific sides, there's two separate locks. This is Pedro Miguel, this is Maris Forest. In order to go through the canal, there's created an access channel, they call a Pacific access channel, into the new locks construction area. And we'll talk more about what it takes for Pacific access channel. This is kind of, this is with the existing that had to bring it down to this level. Uh, major dredging <laughs> project, as one can imagine, on both sides, the Atlantic as well as, as, as the Pacific, deepening, widening of this, of these particular um, uh, areas there. And you can see considerable volume, almost 9 million cubic meters, 18 million cubic meters on the, on the lake side. This is the locks complex, and we will talk more about the locks complex, but there will, on the, on the, on each side, there will be three consecutive locks. There will not be specific one lock and then two. There will be three consecutive locks to bring it down from the 85 level down to the sea level. From there. Uh, on the passage that you see, significant amount of dredging required um, for the project in order to widen it, deepen it. One thing about this, doing the construction of the canal, the canal was still operating. I mean, the, there was no stoppage of of, of, of shipping during this process, so all this had to be done. Um, all the work of deepening and so forth had to be done during the existing operations. Uh, the construction on the Atlantic and Pacific side had no impact on the existing operations of the Gatun locks as well as on the Pacific side, the American Forest locks. Level of 
about uh, 45 centimeters. We go from 26.7 to 27.1 uh, million. <coughs> that allows another 200 million gallons of water um, for the lake for their operations. This is the uh, their overall executive schedule. Um, this is kind of like the start date we're looking at, the start date of initial operations, April 2006. Um, but as you can see, uh, from 2006, seven time frame, here there was a significant amount of time spent uh, defining what the specifications of four foot allows. And we will talk more into the contract, but the largest contract on the project is a design build type contract. So significant time was spent in defining that contract um, in terms of the specifications. And as you can see, we're around here today, but this is Pacific Access Channel was really four phase projects that started in 2007, 2008, but the operations is really not gonna occur until 2006. Yeah. Take a little bit of time to talk about dredging on the, uh, the, on, on, on the project. This is the, uh, this is the Pacific, uh, excuse me, this is the Atlantic side right here. Um, this is the Gatun locks right here. This is the lake. This is the, this is the Caribbean Atlantic Ocean right here. Um, but there was significant dredging on both sides as previously mentioned. The dredging companies, a very known name, Dredging International, John Dino, uh, and you can see quite a bit of violent activity required in the field on the dredging side. Uh, this is the Pacific side. This is this is the locks project and the construction. This is the dredging area and so forth. This is the existing shipping lane you see here. Um, for the, this is the lake side up there. This is the Pacific Ocean side. So you can see considerable dredging activity um, on the project. This is the more pictorial. This is dredging and winding of dredging and widening of the Gatun Lake project. Um, considerable activity in order to dredge it, because once again, um, two things. We've had to maintain existing operations during the canal. Um, and most of the dredging inside the existing route and so forth was done by you know, the Panama Canal dredging have their own dredging division. They were supported by outside. The majority of that was done by their own dredging division. And they have considerable equipment, as you can imagine, to do their own type forces, to do their own work. Um, this is dredging of the blue gray cut. And many probably, if you read any books on the Panama Canal, um, the passage between the, the seas is, is probably the best book out. The path between two seas is best out. You, you read about you know, this is probably the most difficult area of the canal, mud slides and everything else from the original construction of the canal. This work, most of this is done, the dredging and so forth here is mostly done by Panama Canal owned forces on staff. <coughs> this is one of the new uh, cutters that they bought for the project, and they can say this is what, you know, Cuban one, but they have significant amount of quick equipment for them. You can just see the size of it. We're going to move into now the raising of the, the lake, Gatun Lake. As previously mentioned, we're raising up. It doesn't seem like a lot, you know, 1.4 feet and so forth, but it did require, as a result, substantial, um, substantial effort, uh, capital effort uh, for that, the raising the lake, changing the gate mainly increasing in order to increase the capacity by 200 million cubic meters of water. This, these are the spillway gates. They had increased size of the spillway gates and so forth uh, for that, as well as changing, you know, the, change the hydraulics uh, for the spillway gates. This is part of the hydraulic system you see here. Um, this is 
increase in size, you can see the increased size of the, of the gate for the particular spillway. Um, major, major project. I believe that's all complete at the moment. Um, now, take a little bit of time to talk about, remember the Pacific Access Channel, uh, just to kind of get your bearings straight. This is the lake side of the project. Anybody been to Panama? This is the Centennial Bridge, the new bridge. Um, the Pacific sides over here. This is the existing. This this is Pedro Miguel Locks. You remember the locks we saw, maintenance and so forth. This is the existing. Um, this is Mary's Forest Lake. This is the existing route coming from the Atlantic out to the Pacific. This is the Pac-4 access channel. Um, the Pac-4 access channel. Talk about the main components of it, but the Pac-4 access channel, as mentioned, was done in four phases. And some of the phases was to remove um, kind of kind of munitions. You know, this used to be a U.S. Army military zone, so there's quite a bit of activity removing explosives and so forth prior to construction of it. And that was done in pretty much four phases. This is used to be. You know, when I first arrived down here, we were working on Pack 1, it used to be a little hill there. In order to award the Phase 4 of the contract, they had to get it to, um, had to get it to a sea level prior to awarding Phase 4. And that's where we are now. This is kind of the, this is the bridge. Uh, it, you know, this is the existing route of the canal here. As you can see, this is the Centennial Bridge, Pedro Miguel Locks, Maris Forest Locks, this is going to be the new locks. This is the Atlantic Ocean. This is the access channel coming in here. We'll talk more in detail of the access channel in a minute. Um, this is the existing canal, uh, 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 Maris Forest Lake. Uh, this is the, as, as mentioned, um, excavation, almost 15 million cubic meters ex need to be excavated. 400 million hectares of, of, of munitions in order to move forward on this project. This is the Puerto Rican Dam. This is the dam separating the existing canal from the new Pacific Access Channel. Okay, uh, you will see the dam itself is a rock filled with earth core, um, kind of in. Um, and, the, and the dam design was by, you know, done by URS. It's it's going to be about a four kilometers long. This, this dam here, the height of the dam is going to be about 30 meters. But there's going to be a separation between the existing locks and um, the Pacific Access Channel. Quite a challenging project. I think last week they're at 29 meters of this particular height of the new dam. There. This is some construction of the Barrington Dam. So uh, you can see the coffer dam areas is th that they had to put in. This is the existing operation. This is it used to be. This is all dry now and quite naturally. Um, this is where part of the channel is going to go. This is all going to get filled and so forth. And this is probably a picture taken in 2010, maybe early 2011, uh, building the uh, kind of Barrington coffer dam. This is the uh, once again, Pedro Miguel Locks. This is Maris Forest Lakes. Um, this is that bridge, Centennial Bridge. You can see this is the route of the new access channel. Um, what's the height differential? This is what it's going to look at. There's going to be a nine meter, nine meter difference between existing operations and the new channel coming in. And this is a you know audit condition of you know the Borinquen Dam right there. about the third set of locks, the really the big guts of the program, what everybody reads about today in so forth. Once again, I always thought of the Centennial Bridge. This is the access channel coming into the third set of locks. The third set of locks is a single lane. The existing locks is actually two lanes. It's really, you have three channels there, three different lanes coming in. 
These are what we call water saving basins, and I give you more details in a little video on that later. There, yeah, these are the chambers, this is the control areas, and so forth. But this is the access to the Pacific from here. Um, going, going out once again the channel, going through the blocks, and this is the existing Maris Force Lakes right there. A little bit about the third set of locks contract. The contract was let, um, signed in July 2009, July 15th, 19, 2009, a year after we were, Towson was involved. I remember getting involved when it was um, looking at revision number 15 of the contract language. It actually was awarded on revision 22 or 23 just because there was considerable questions regarding the design specifications, whether or not it was seismic issues, whether or not it was bonding issues, serious challenges in terms of, in order, in order to maintain a competitive bid for this project, there was a lot of questions by the bidders itself. Uh, the contract was awarded to what they call GUPC, or Grupo Unidos Esperal Canal, called the UPC, GUPC, but it's a consortium of members as you see here. You got Cecilia out of Spain, Il Pugillo out of Italy, you got John De Mule out of Belgium, and you got Constructor uh, Urbano out of Panama. Cecilia and Il Pugillo, they have 48% interest. The other two parties have 2% there. Um, are there challenges? I don't know if anybody's worked in Europe, but there are challenges dealing with the many different cultures on, on, on this project. Uh, the lead designers for the project is, was, was really by Montgomery Watson Herzog out of Chicago. Um, they were the lead U.S. designers. The, I, you know, the IV group are the designers of the lock gates themselves, and we'll talk more about the lock gates. Um, in Petrotech, U.S., out of Bellevue, Washington, they were the designers mainly of the, uh, the valves, control systems for the valves in there. Uh, the gate manufacturer is out of Shimalai. Anybody familiar with Shimalai? Shimalai is doing the World Trade Center, I mean the World Freedom Tower, the new transit center, that big structural system out there. Same, same, same fabricator. When I visited their yard in uh, Italy, I saw parts of the, of the uh, transit um, hub being fabricated there. So I actually ran a few port authority quality engineers doing the same thing I was doing, doing quality audits for that project. So, uh, but Shimalai is the gate manufacturer. Um, the design, there were six different design offices around the world. Um, the design integration offices in Panama City, that's where pretty much everything come together. But you had design centers in Chicago, Bellevue, Washington, Buenos Aires, Milan, Rottingham, and Rottingham being the Ivy Group. The only design center that we did not visit, Towson itself did not visit, was probably Milan. But all the other design centers, part of our task is ensuring whether or not the designers are living up to their terms of the agreement schedule. Not necessarily financial, but all the deliverables <coughs> required in the contract that their quality programs are in place, uh, that their submittal documentation was, um, was accurate and so forth. So I'm a kind of guy, and, and one of the things I preach to uh, the canal authority, you need to be hands-on. Although it's a design-build type contract, you need to go out and just don't sit and wait to get the keys turned to you. You need to go visit these people and spend considerable time with them. But you can see the activities here in terms of each design center major uh, 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 role that they played there. The design itself, and as you will see here, this is a rendition of a, here you will see tugboat. The tugboat, the initial canal, you probably heard about the mules pulling the ships along. The canal. There will be no mules for this, uh, for the phase, for this expansion program. Now what, what series of tugboats made out of Spain um, to pull the new ships coming through, uh, uh, you know, the project itself. Go into a little bit about the design. What's what's the difference between the existing canal and the new canal? Okay. Quite naturally, 
larger, in theory more efficient lots. The existing canal capacity is about 4,400 TUs. The size is about 305, 305 meters. The height is about 34 meters. The depth is about 18 meters. But as you can see, with the new canal lots, we're significantly increasing you know, the depth of it from, four, from 12 to almost 18 meters. The length, 427 compared to 304. The width from 33 to 55 meters. A significant increase in size of the canal. What's it mean? This is just a little bit about the canal. The Empire State Building can fit in one of the chambers. Wow. You walk in that chamber, it's massive. You know, it can fit in. The gates itself is 11-story building. 30, 30 meters, 30 feet wide. It's 11 story meter, 30 feet wide. And if you're a golfer, 18 holes of dust to two good golf shots to get from the one, you know, from one lock head to another lock. Massive, massive um, project. Some of the key data, I know we're all numbers people, it sounds like a lot of people in here, um, engineers. From a standpoint of just for the third set of locks. Concrete, 4.4 .4 cubic million cubic meters of concrete for the two sides of the locks. Some would say for any major city, that's a good series of some 20-story buildings. Um, in terms of reinforcing steel, rebar, 192 ton, tons. I read the other day that it's equal to 19 Eiffel Towers. Uh, you know, one of the challenges you look at amount of excavation, almost 40 million cubic meters. You can see it's a massive logistical problem in terms of just movement of all resources to, you know, to handle it. Now, you think about Panama. Panama has, does not really have these resources at all. All this had to be brought in mainly from a worker standpoint, the equipment standpoint, special designs. You know, Panama does not have the infrastructure to handle you know, this major uh, 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 quantities of equipment. The gates, when you talk about the 16 major gates, valves and so forth, the gates are made out of, the gates are made out of Italy, as I mentioned, culvert valves and conduit equalization valves. These are all made by um, Hyundai out of China, out of um, South Korea and portions of China. Control buildings are 64 control buildings along. Some of these pictures are uh, this is construction of the, you know the gate area, the recess area for the gates coming in. Uh, this is some nighttime construction, just uh, doing the walls of the church. And this is very early on into massive. These are seven seven seventies, 30 maybe 40 cubic meter uh, 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 caterpillars. There's nothing like watching. You see 40 or 50 of these things just lined up. Like a, it's like a, a big sail or something, a big massive truck sail. It's very interesting when they stop work on the canal, you see all this major equipment lined up and you think about how much that's costed on a daily basis. Big yard sale. Talk a little bit about excavation. Um, and this is a little bit. Once again, I go back. This is the, cent the Centennial Bridge. This is the existing locks. Um, what you see here, anybody idea what this is? This from World War II? That's it. This is, they, they actually attempted to do a canal, uh, 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 an expansion in 1939. And this is the, one of the routes for, this is called the 1939 excavation, pretty much. Um, because of seismic conditions, this route was not used for this canal. This is the route for the canal mainly came by this area. This area now is going to become where the water saving basin is. One of the major studies that they did a seismic to be part of this is do we use this existing 1939 excavation? As you can see, it's a significant advantage. It's already been excavated and so forth. Unfortunately, it cannot be used. So this is just some pictures from 2009. This is pictures 2010. This is the canal area. Uh, third set of locks. This is the existing, this is the existing lake, Maris Forest Lake. 
This is now the now begin the watering committee. This is 2011. You can see activity. They take this area right here is the um, now what they call the industrial park, gas uh, major batch plant and so forth. As you can see it's beginning to take shape. It's the beginning to drive us out and fill it. Another picture, 2011 and 2012. You can see this is the major chamber area right now. Backfill for 39 excavation, existing lock area there. 2013. We did work, I mean they did work, I'll say we we I did do a couple of night shifts, they they did work three shifts on this project. Workers, you know, was not in um, I think peak workers may have been at uh, nine or ten thousand between the consultants and laborers for both of the different sites. Um, for that, um, this is a site of night activity. This is 2014. You can see it's really taking shape. This is where this is specific access channel going into the chamber. And this is the approach area going out to the Pacific area. And this is the major. This is. This is the batch plan for the construction. Um, so, excuse me, for concrete work here. Atlantic side. Once again, you have 1939 excavation. Fortunately for the Atlantic side, they were able to use this and it really helped them because the Atlantic side is probably six months ahead of schedule. Not ahead of schedule, but ahead of the schedule for the Pacific side. You basically it's the same project on both sides, but the Atlantic side, the only, only problem with the Atlantic side is rainy season. It rains a hell of a lot more in the Atlantic than it does on the Pacific side, so you got to deal with those conditions. But this right now, any guess what this is? This is a storage area for, for the gates, for the existing gates, the mitered gates, you know, in case you got to replace them. You know, this has got to lake right here. This is existing gates. Um, just to see how it unfold, this is 2010. You can see it's taking shape. This is the uh, Atlantic Ocean right here. 2011. This right here is an observation area in which uh, they were building because they wanted, it's a people's project. So they wanted people to come out, visit the project. They did not do the same for the Pacific side, for the Atlantic side, they did. Um, this is the batch area, the industrial area, the park. Over here is the existing Gatun Lake. This is the going out. 2012, 13, and down to 14. This is that industrial, that's the visitor center. This is the lake. This is Gatun Lake. It's going to head out on right to the Pacific out there. Just a few pictures about. You can see the massive scale of concrete activity taking place on the Atlantic side. Um, just nothing but cranes. You can see the, some of the Rotex. Uh, this concrete was batched, uh, loaded here, loaded, uh, transported, and poured down the site. This is construction of one of the lock heads, recess area, in which the gates will go in. Early construction of the uh, Pacific side of where the lot had activity. Uh, massive construction. A lot of blasting, uh, quite a bit of blasting. You can almost see a blasting at daily that's a schedule that they had to submit um, in order to blast the ball salt. All the ball salt here was pretty much used as the aggregate for the concrete. Talk a little bit about procurement. Um, as I mentioned, worldwide procurement. Um, I don't think there's not too many countries except for Africa that we did not buy, that UPC did not buy anything uh, from. We have uh, Canada, US, Mexico. Most of the rebar came out of Mexico. The gates and so forth came out of Italy. Um, the design of uh, 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 Netherlands is that's where the gates are, Spain. A lot of control equipment, mostly electronics, or the MCCs, came out of Eaton in the U.S., Bosch Retro, a lot of name vendors. One thing about this project is I would say 
part of the specification is you had to use stuff that worked. They didn't want to introduce a lot of new technology, things that were not tested, proven technologies. So some of the specifications you had to go with proven technologies because remember the canal already has an operating canal. They know what they're doing. They were, the, they were not trying to test the latest and the greatest. They wanted something that worked. So they had to, you know, uh, Bosch Rexroth worked there many years, worked on the existing canal. A lot of their uh, hydraulic stuff is already in the existing canal. So worldwide procurement uh, and part of Altas's Towson is to, to visit, uh, to make sure these vendors in the various countries are doing what they're supposed to do. So we may visit South Korea, China, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, uh, Panama, quite a bit of activity in the U.S. as well as Canada. Um, talk a little bit about gate fabrication um, done in Italy. This is a uh, small rendition of a B301. This is the first gate that was fabricated. Uh, the gates, just think about what is it, little blocks. Basically, they form blocks and they stack them on each other, um, as you would do uh, in Legos and so forth. So the formation of gates, this is the drawing of, of, of gate steel, and, and really plate steel. Plate steel was all purchased out of Europe. Um, there was a discussion about purchase out of China and other places. But once again, it came down to a quality decision. Do they want to accept the quality? Since it was a European fabricator, they felt more comfortable with European vendors for the fabrication for all gates. But these are all plates. Uh, you go to Shimalai shop, quite capacity to do this work. And actually, Shimalai built several new facilities in order to accommodate uh, kind of this work while we were there. Um, this is their gate fabrication in San Giorgio uh, de, de Negro. You can see this is one of the blocks. You can see these are individual blocks. Uh, typically, a gate has 40, uh, 20 blocks formed on it, five, five stories and then four, four across. This is five, one, two, three, four. And pretty much you just make a block, you stack them up, you weld them together. Sounds simple, but it's really not that simple. But it's, it's really, that's, that's what it is. Each of these gates, um, Total tonnage for all the gates is about 50,000 tons. The average, uh, the largest gate, I think, weighs about 41, 4,200 tons. The uh, smaller gate probably weighs about 2,500. Uh, quite naturally, the average, you know, the largest gate is on the Pacific side to deal with the tidals of waves and so forth of, of, of Pacific. Near the ocean, the gates in the middle um, of, of the chamber is not as heavy. Uh, but um, this is the same shop in which the transit hub is being fabricated for, you know, down at the Freedom Tower uh, down here. But um, this is the ship, this is the gate. So you can see they have a massive crane that loads each one of the blocks that they're fabricated and painted onto each other to build up to this. Talk a little bit about transportation of the gates, and then I'll show you a quick video. Right, this is, as you see here, going out in July uh, 2013. I actually happened to be there and in, in, it was about a month late going out, but I had a pre-scheduled trip to go out and it was fascinating to see that pull out from the port the first ship uh, gates. Um, talk about issues with shipping, I don't know if you have worldwide logistics and so forth, the ship changed names two days before it was about to ship. The ship actually once it got to Panama and unloaded, it got arrested. The ship <laughs> didn't get arrested for whatever reason. They had some issues in Panama. Um, this bottom picture you can see here is a picture of the ship. You know, this is the Atlantic side. Um, this is the canal under construction. This is Gatun Lake. This is a dock in which you will see in which they had to be built in order to unload the ship. This is actually on the ship. Um, this picture's uh, you can see how they brace against the ship. Show you a little video about construction of uh, how the ships are moved, how they're transported. This is actually in Italy. They're taken one by one, loaded onto a barge, 
at the fabricated at the fabricated yard, um, and this takes about one week per uh, per uh, per gate. This is all the fabrication facilities you see there. Um, this is the loading. Once that barge is in Port of Trust, it, it loads onto the it loads onto the particular ship here. And as you can see, this is the four ships going out called Sunrise. This is the route in which it, it takes from, from the Port of Trusty and over to Panama. Once it's in Panama, they unload it and talk about that dock that had to be made. The same wheel carriers that they use in Italy they transport it over to um, the unload ship. They unload the, the gate and they have free range sequencing as far as um, where you can see they got eight gates and so forth. And this is taking the gate, now they're taking the gate going into the, uh, um, oh, the skew. This is taking the gate going from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side. So to move from the Atlantic and get the eight gates over, they actually went through the canal itself and unloaded a special dock that was made on the Pacific side. <coughs> and this is unloading one of the gates called the parking area. Um, but so they had eight gates on each side, the Atlantic side, eight gates on the Pacific side. Um, fairly, it looks very simple there, but fairly complex um, operation there. Just a couple of pictures. Um, this is the unloading of the gates on the Atlantic side. This is um, Gatun Lake here. This is the Gatun Locks. This is the Atlantic. This is the unloading area. As you can see, they're moving the ships. They're moving the gates um, from uh, here to their different position. This gate is actually getting ready to move into the chamber itself. Because once the gates get here, the chamber's ready, then they store them in inside the chamber in order to create extra space to load the other gates. All gates were delivered by November of 2014. Needless to say, it was a, it was a challenge. Uh, and this is a gate. This is the Atlantic Ocean. This is you can see the gate. This is a gate being moved from the from the loading area, dock area, moving into the uh, actual chamber itself. This is a gate going through Maris Flores Locks. Remember, moving the gates from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side. This is on a single barge. You can imagine the celebration and everything. And keep on, you know, you can actually see the gate from the office coming through, uh, you know, the existing lot. Very, uh, uh, here, this is Yatun Lake. This is, you can see here, there's gates inside the chamber. In order to create storage barrier for the other gate, still quite a bit of construction going on here, but as you can see, they begin storing the gates here inside, inside the chamber. See more gates, one, two, three. Um, but this is this is a ramp, specially built ramp due to the size and weight and so forth to into the chamber. This is, this is the lake side, this is the Atlantic side. Pacific side, you can see the gates, this is the approach, this is just kind of pictorial of you can see the gates going. They're about to load these gates into what they call the recess area. Uh, this is what they call the locket area. This space between here is where this gate will actually turn and go inside here. You don't believe that they can do it, but when you see it in action, it's like, wow, mm -hmm. not turn. It's very, very complicated, but and it's all done remotely on the guy just he's just walking with it. Um, it's, you know, it's fascinating to watch. You can see the, the size of these gates. You know, these, are, these are little cars right here. These are cars. You know, it's a pickup truck. You see the size of this. You see the <laughs> shot. This is a gate actually going into its recess area. These right, this right here, you can see these are what they call maintenance gates. These, these gates will be maintained inside what they call the recess area. These are the in stops for the gates. You can bring this gate, slide it on in, um, and they need to do maintenance for it. Put it on the hooks. There's two gates, what they call lock it. This is this is a lock These are two gates already inside.
with you know release us or this is what this is you know, these are specially built uh, frames in order to lift the gate as they do under the gates itself, all this area down here is temporary concrete because under the gates itself is, you know, these are rolling gates versus the mighty gates. These are rolling gates, all the rails and so forth is here. These are mainly designed out of the North Sea um, rolling gates. If you've been to Antwerp or the North Sea, they have massive rolling gates there. And that's why we selected the IV group. Just the size of these gates. Um, uh, that's why the IV group The water saving basins. The water saving basins, the big, the big you know, there's three water saving basins, and, and the really reason is saving the amount of water. Um, you know, less water than this, you know, if we use 60% of the water, just to kind of a little bit about, this is the ship. Say there, water will go from here into the water saving basin and vice versa. Um, this is kind of, see water, ship lowering, ship gets down to this level, it's moving along, um, and then we refill it, and so far, before it goes back. That's the basic principle of really the water saving basins. Um, they do not have to use the water saving basins for every operation. Um, from the, uh, this is water saving basins going from into the chamber itself to fill the chamber. See water coming into the chamber. Here you also see now water going out of the chamber in terms of so these are the you know these are the linear ports in which I talked about earlier. This is inside the culvert. You know, there you can actually put two trains inside the culvert. That's how huge these things are for the water. Um, this is the one of the one of the, the valves being built in Korea. Um, you can just see the massive size of it. <coughs> This is the construction of the conduit. You know, water's going to come in from here, go around, and then spread out into the, the chamber itself. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Atlantic side, another aerial view. Existing operations. Um, existing op this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the chamber itself. This is the um, artificial and you know, this is the approach. Like I said, the chamber, approach structure, the chamber itself, the, the control buildings, um, quite massive. Um, talk about expansion milestones, it's really, you know, 2007, first blast on the hill for the project, and as I said, it's in 2009, uh, contract was awarded, and just last week, and I have to be in Panama, you probably read all about the first water going into the chamber. This is the turning of the first valves last Thursday. This is about 50,000 um, cubic meters per hour, million gallons, yeah, 50,000 million gallons of water going in per hour in order to flood the first chamber. Not totally flood, this is going from um, the Atlantic side going down to the first chamber nearest the Atlantic uh, ocean. Here. This is just water flowing in. Big day. Talk about the future of the canal. I think everybody knows uh, what's correct on Panama. Quite naturally, the canal gives considerable amount of money back to the country, the Panama Canal back to the country. Last year, I think, they may have given $900 billion back to the country to support various infrastructure programs and so forth. Long-term job, reinvestment. Panama is going to build new terminals, new ports. They're thinking about doing ship repair, logistics hubs. So quite a bit of impact on Panama itself both sides, not, going, not just the Panama City, but also on the Cologne side, in the U.S. Traffic East Coast ports, imagine the amount of traffic, um, you know, significant increase investment in the East Coast. Off and down Miami, spending a billion dollars, get the Bayon Bridge to be raised by six by 64 feet, six stories. Savannah, Norfolk, you name a port on the East Coast, they have to spend money, significant amount of money dredging to support that. Panama, um, you know, unfortunately, I think the U.S. government is a bit behind on funding some of these projects. Um, it's, 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 it's unfortunate. I've been in a lot of meetings, but people are now getting prepared uh, uh, for the project. Um, 
just uh, another thing, when the Panama Canal was first looked at in terms of violence, it did not focus on liquefied petroleum gas, liquefied natural gas, or the shale business. It was not in the calculation. But guess what? Now it has to be. You have significant opportunities for LNG, you know, the route from the U.S. Gulf Coast to Japan and so forth through the canal saves money. You know, I mean, if you look at all the shale projects in the U.S., all this now becomes a play for a future canal, whether or not it's a fourth lane or other projects, it all is a play. You can look at the various projects that's, uh, some of these have already been, some of these have already been approved, but all, but, you know, you go to the state of Louisiana right now, there's probably five, ten billion dollars of LNG plants being built. That whole chemical alley from New Orleans to Lake Charles, is, it's, it's crazy construction, but it's all about the shale play and guess where it's going to go. Probably through the canal. So, I uh, want to say thank you. Um, open the question <laughs> um, on the project. You guys. And actively is presenting uh, uh, an expression of, uh, in, uh, of thanks to Robert for this uh, kind and, uh, and timely talk. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. Thank you.